It's a bit more promising, isn't it? Good morning. Okay. One of these demonstrations, it was in a huge hall with about 200 people, and I was absolutely terrified. And right before I went on stage, my colleague leaned over and whispered to me, he says, don't worry, mate, it's a live software demonstration. It's cold you haven't had the guts to release yet. What could possibly go wrong? Let's find out. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is um, the front page of Ice Bear, uh, where we have all these different elements. Um, so this is the list of um, the most recent plate inspections that we've pulled in from our Formulatrix imagers. Um, this is not up to date because it's my development system. Uh, but we can see uh, the plate barcode dates uh, where, where it was imaged. Um, and on a bigger screen, we'd have the project ID as well. Um, down here, we can see the imager loading um, from, from our, our two big imagers um, with uh, which, which plates are active, which are expired. We can click off into that and see which plates we need to pull from the imager. You can get this information downstairs from Rock Imager, but this means you can do it from the desk. Uh, over here, disk usage, that's not working on this machine, but uh, on the live system I can, again, see all the disks, not only on the IceBear server itself, but also the, the Formulatrix disks. Uh, that becomes important because as our disk fills up, we need to tell Rockmaker to empty the disk, clear away all the old images that nobody's ever going to look at again, but also to clear up the database. And... Uh, Certainly, historically, that started at the beginning of their database and worked through plate by plate. So if you, if you catch it when it hits 99% and hit the button, it's still several days before we would see images disappearing. Uh, they've, they've improved on that dramatically now, but uh, certainly it's nice to have that warning when you see the disk getting up to about 80%. I can jump down there and sort that out. Um, and then uh, some, some uh, tasks which... Uh, for me are mostly related to activating new users, but um, for, uh, for scientists it's more like you have this plate in the imager, you need to pull it out now. Um, this plate doesn't have a protein set on it, so uh, you need to go and do that. And uh, basically we're just trying to nudge you and uh, not, not force you to do something right now, but remind you that you really should do this at some point. Um, it's... We don't, we don't want to get in the way, but at the same time, we, we want to encourage you to, to do everything that you need to do. Uh, container management, we will come back to later. All right, now everything in uh, IceBear is in a project. Um, basically, what a project is, is it's a way of grouping together a, a bunch of work um, that has something in common, probably the protein and also allowing you to assign access rights to it. Uh, we've only got one plate in this project. Um, here are the proteins in there, so we can create a new protein, um, which I won't bother doing now, but let's just have a look at this one. I recommend that you keep one protein per project, but uh, some people don't do it that way. So we have the, the full name, a, a description there as well, the protein acronym is what identifies it at the synchrotron for safety purposes, so this one is important. Uh, within that, you can have different constructs, uh, and you can add sequences to that construct, um, which come up like this. Uh, you can put multiple sequences in here, so it supports complexes, which is uh, always nice. And over here, we can see all the user groups and who can do what within this project. Um, if, if you're the administrator or if you own the project, then uh, you can change these permissions on and off, just, just like that. Okay. So in this plate overview, you can see this, uh, whose plate it is, the best score along with that, with that uh, color, color graph bar there. We'll see, we'll see those colors more in a moment. So having a look at a plate, uh, this is what a plate looks like in Icebear when it's all filled in properly. Um, we, we pull the plate in from the Formulatrix. We know whose plate it is, but we don't know necessarily what's in it. So 
it's it's your responsibility then as the plate owner to set the screen and say what protein it is and then when you set that protein the plate is moved into the appropriate project and the access rights apply up until that point you're the only one who can see it so we've got a fairly nice uh, complete imaging history here um, that might be the reason why I chose this plate for the demonstration uh, We've got some crystals marked in here, which uh, really shouldn't have at this point. Uh, I'm going to go in here and monkey this demonstration very quickly while nobody's looking. Oh, hello. There we go. Let's try that again. There we go. That's, that's what I was expecting to see. We're going to go and fish the other ones in a minute. Uh, the protein... This is what we can see because we've filled in the information in the project and because we've put this plate into this project, we can now see what the protein is on this plate. We can go off and change that. We can add in buffer and concentration information in here as well. And we've already set the screen. So we have a full list of the uh, screen conditions here. Uh, for setting a standard screen, it is, uh, it is literally just click this up, um, there's a whole load of garbage in here because it's my test box, but just hit the choose button and it changes that screen. Uh, if you're doing optimizations, you have a number of options. Uh, we can upload an Excel spreadsheet into it, um, either a simple two column Excel spreadsheet, here's your well identifier, here's your conditions. Uh, some of the guys in the lab use uh, Mimer, which uh, generates the screen conditions uh, and you save that as a CSV file. I spare will eat that and generate these, this list of conditions for you. We can also take the Word document straight out of our Tekan robot. So there's a nice table in there, an 8x12 uh, eight table with um, all the well conditions in it. Uh, we, we can take that and it will, again, it will eat that quite happily and parse the conditions out into this list. If you upload it into, uh, if you upload something that it doesn't recognize, it's okay with that. It will just say, uh, C file and uh, over in the files tab over here uh, we can see that the the uh, the file that you uploaded is attached to this plate anyway so you can open this up and go and see what the relevant condition was uh, over here we have drop conditions uh, well well and protein solution we saw the file tab already and um, you can add notes against this plate, or, or basically against anything in Icebear. You, you can just, just add notes wherever you, wherever you feel you need to. So we've got all these um, imaging sessions here on this plate. Um, what we really want to do is go off and have a look at the images. So let's jump in here and see what we've got. So there's a nice big fat crystal. Again, that might be the reason why I chose this plate. <laughs> <laughs> Might not be. Um, so over here we have the image. Um, we can bring up a ruler by pressing M and that just follows the mouse around so we can stick it on that corner of the crystal. And we can read off the other side that that's, uh, that's 600 micron across. It's a great big fat juicy crystal. Um, this scale information comes in from the Formulatrix. Uh, the Rockmaker database has a microns per pixel scale so as long as the, the image has come from there, we know that this, this scale is accurate. Uh, we can roll over this first image here and it will just swap that in and swap it out. Um, this is the last image, so you won't see a difference here, but it means that if you want to see whether this grew or was contamination from the very beginning, you can do that very quickly. Um, we'll have a look at the full-time course in a moment. Uh, we can score just by clicking any of these. These colors uh, come from Rockmaker. They're, they're not ours. If this box down here is checked, then let's just rescore this just for, for interest's sake. So you could score that and it jumps onto the next drop. Now, keyboard shortcuts work. Uh, so you can just sit there with the numeric keypad and 0, 9, 1, 3, 2 and just rattle through the entire plate and score it very, very quickly if you want to do so. Um, before I do anything else, I'm going to go back to the first one and I'm going to score that again properly. There we go. Uh, so we've got full navigation up here. Go to the end. Uh, this plate is only half full, so D12 is the last well. Uh, go back to the start. and We can play one by one. Go through very, very quickly. 
hey, that's interesting. Let's, let's have a look at that. Let's go back. Yeah, so there's, there's a nice one there. Okay. So you can see the whole drop very, very quickly. Again, there are keyboard shortcuts for that. Uh, the arrow keys will advance you well by well. Um, and if you go control, then uh, uh, the left and right keys, it will take you drop by drop. Uh, this is a one drop plate, so it won't make any difference. But if you've got three drop plates, then uh, that becomes important. Uh, we can get an overview of the whole plate, complete with the, the scores and colors. Uh, we get a pretty good idea what's going on there straight away. Uh, but our 20 degree imager has UV, so we've got some UV images here. So we can swap over and very, very quickly now we, we, have, we have a great overview of, of what's going on in the whole plate. And uh, bringing this up gives you a slightly, slightly bigger version. If you have multiple drops here, it compare them side by side, which is, which is nice. And clicking on that will take you to the, to the relevant well. So let's go back to the beginning here. Um, time course, as you might imagine, it shows you every image that's ever been taken of this drop. And as you mouse over, it swaps them in and out. Uh, we can turn off all the visible images and only look at the UV, or we can only look at the visible. And then you'll see down here, this image was scored, so the the, the color barcode, the color bar for the score is there as well. We can rewind this right back to the beginning, and if we press play, yeah, that's cool. I could do that all day. <laughs> yeah, let's see. it's not my crystal, sadly, but uh, it's it's still cool to watch it grow. Yeah, yeah, let's do it again. There we go. That's fantastic. Does it get smaller? Uh, it gets smaller if you run backwards. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to see that. That's bad. Yeah. There we go. And again, um, if you bring it up, you you could even uh, click on that and set it to that point and uh, and measure it at that 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 point if you wanted to do so. Um, wish this Wi-Fi would go away. There we go. Um, so as Rick showed you, here's the information that. Uh, came from the, the project and from the plate and from the screen. Uh, that's all combined here to show you in a single screenshot basically everything we needed to know about how we got this crystal. It's, uh, but that, that is only there if you, if you fill in the, the information correctly. Uh, when we import from the formulatrix, as I say, we don't know the protein, don't know the well solution, don't know the protein solution, don't know the drop volumes. We know what kind of plate it is, we know whose plate it is, and we know what imager it was in, but everything else you have to, you have to tell it. Um, we probably could import from the formulatrix, but uh, certainly in the beginning, the, the user compliance was not at a level where we felt confident in doing that. There was a lot of stuff that was crystallizing in water. Um, that's better now. We could probably, probably make the leap and import the screen conditions and uh, everything would be accurate. And then over here, hiding behind the uh, annoying Windows box, we have this, uh, will you go away? There we go. So this is the, uh, again, Rick, Rick showed you this, this screen with the, uh, the crystal that we've, we've selected from that drop. Um, there's really only one candidate there that we're, we're interested in. Um, so there's some other information here that we can we can fill in if we know this stuff already, or if we shoot it on the home source, we can we can put in this uh, unit cell and space group information to bring up the list of space groups and uh, just pick one and change it. Um, we have the sample name here. As Rick said, this is this is the protein acronym for the safety reasons, and then we've um, got the plate barcode, well drop crystal number, so that. We can look at the sample name when we're at that the synchrotron and, and know exactly where it came from and what's in it. Uh, we can add a suffix to that if we want to, and that's and then that, that's now the sample name that that full string. Oh, bother with that. Uh, all of this stuff is what goes down to the synchrotron if we know it. Uh, we can add a, a shipping comment here. So do this one first because it's cool. Um, we can. Select an additional crystal here from this well if we wanted to. It's not really a lot of point because there's nothing there. And again, we can then fill that, that information in. If we don't want to carry that one forward, so we can delete it. 
All right. I think I've covered everything that's in here. So this is this is uh, all in production at our. This is being used every day. From here on in, everything you're going to see exists pretty much only on this laptop, and uh, it it should work. It's mostly stable, but uh, like the man said, I'm not brave enough to release it yet. So uh, uh, things may go a little bit wonky, but we'll we'll get through it. So if you want to fish the crystals, so now we're um, moving beyond the stage of hey that's really interesting and it's now it's uh, yeah we're going to take this to the synchrotron so we're at the bench uh, with our touch screen and our barcode scanner and we've got our, our pucks here we've got our pins here we've got the plate ready to go and what we're going to do I couldn't be bothered bringing pins and pucks with me so I'm going to cheat I've got a sheet full of barcodes here I also can't be bothered to type them so I brought the barcode scanner so Let's uh, give ourselves a puck, it just appears over there, and you can see there's 0 out of 10 in there, so that puck is empty. Uh, we'll give ourselves a dewer, it comes up there, and some pins. All right, and then we'll take our plate, that's the same plate as we were working with earlier. And now we've got a nice layout of what's on the bench, um, with our pins lined up here, our puck sitting nicely in the liquid nitrogen ready to go. Uh, we've got the overview of the plate, we've got only the one crystal in this plate, the colours are the scores that you saw before, so straight away we can get a nice overview here, we can see well the red ones are the ones we're probably interested in. We can click here and we can see that same crystal with the crosshairs there. Um, to fish this crystal we want to have the absolute minimum amount of user interaction with the, with the system as possible. Uh, we, we had a previous attempt at this where it was, oh, we need a box to, to write in the cryo conditions. We need a, a box to write in the soaking. And we need another box for this and another box for this and another box and another box and another box. And uh, it was completely unworkable. So uh, not surprisingly, it, uh, it really didn't get filled in properly. Uh, so this is, this is our, our second go around based on that experience. And uh, it's the reason why we bought a touch screen. We can keep it up off the bench. We don't have to have a keyboard there. We don't have a, have a mouse there. Uh, just absolute minimum interaction. So this, this is how we fish a crystal. Drag. Onto the pin. Release. Done. That's it. Uh, you don't have to fill in any of this stuff if you want. If you don't want to. Uh, while you're getting your next pin and uh, faffing around with your next plate, this box will just quietly go away and uh, and you can do the next one. Uh, that That's it. It's done. Uh, if we are looking through the plate and we... Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I'm taking that one to the synchrotron, definitely. So we click on that. We create another crystal. We'll drag it onto the pin. Whack. It's gone into the puck, just like that. And again, we can edit this if we want to. System's already added a note to explain where it came from and where it's gone. Um, and there we have it. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, this, this is just a, a picture. It's, it's not uh, filling in. Maybe we should do that. Um, but, yeah, so, so what it's doing is uh, this is configurable, but by default, it, um, if you put the crystal onto the pin, it will automatically put the pin straight into the first empty puck position. It's assuming that that's what you want to do. Um, and if we, if we click that, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I expected to happen. It's, um, you didn't see this, okay. Let's bring that um, puck back up. We'll get our idea. Our and our plate. There we are. So hopefully now, yes. So now we have the, the full list of what's going on inside this puck. And you can see that it's, it's just building it up one by one. Uh, you can also fish directly from the well. If you don't uh, particularly care about which crystal it is, um, or if there's lots of small ones, just drag it straight over there. And if you're not using barcoded pins, you don't, well you can't scan the pins but you can drop it straight into the puck, in theory. 
yeah, in theory. Um, and then it would, uh, would come up in this list again with uh, everything you see here, except there's, there's no pin barcode. So you don't have to use the barcoded pins. iSpare will help you, will let you work without them. Uh, but uh, we, we recommend that you do. Let's close that down. All right. Now, hopefully, it will let me take that puck. Now we're finished with it. And we'll drop it straight into our Dewar. And when Windows stops complaining about the Wi Fi, you'll see a link behind here ship this Dewar. All right. So we've, we've got our, our, our thing ready to go. Now, we, we could just walk away at this point, stick it in the corner and leave it and when we have the bean time we can come back and, and create the shipment. But if you're doing things at the last minute, plane leaves in three hours and you're still madly fishing, you can just throw it all in the Dewar. We'll click this link. Uh, yes, we definitely want to leave this page because uh, the plane is on its way. Uh, I'll call this one demo. We will send it to the SRF. Hit create. Right. And there we have the overview of our shipment. It hasn't gone anywhere yet, but we can see where it is, where it's from. We can uh, add in another Dewar. Very. Okay, and uh, we just have one tab per Dewar here. So we can remove this one because it's got nothing in it. But in the, the Dewar that we were working with earlier, we can see that we have the puck there and we have the pins. Uh, we could even take this one. I'm just, gonna, I'm just going to do it this way. In fact, that's uh, 833. It closes that all the time. Let's uh, say we put that in position 5. Then in theory, we should be able to put it straight into there. So we can move this stuff around to reflect reality. Uh, if somebody brings you a pin that they've had stuck stuck in the cane in the storage cane for some time, like, hey, you're going to the synchrotron. Can you set, can you take my crystal? Yeah, beep. Just just uh, scan the barcode in, and it will add it straight into the shipment. So now we've got uh, everything we need to know. Uh, all our samples have got their protein acronym here. Uh, we don't have any empty pins floating around. We don't have any empty pucks or empty jewers. So this should be good to go. So at that point, we come across here. We press send shipment. Do you really, really want to do that? Yeah, yeah, we really want to do that. We press OK. Shipment has been sent. And uh, it reloads. Now behind the scenes, uh, this is actually generating all the data that will go down to the synchrotron in the format that uh, the SRF are expecting. At the moment, it's just uh, creating it and then dropping it on the floor because it doesn't know what to do with it. But uh, we're quite close to being able to send that directly to ESRF over the wire. And uh, at that point, the ice by B at the receiving end will unpack it. And you saw your shipments in, in ice by B with, with all, the, all the pins and all the samples there. That will just be created for you automatically as a result of pressing that button. Uh, so, so yeah, we're, we're close to doing that, but we are not quite there. And that's about everything to be said about shipping, um, except that when you come back, there's still some work to do. So we can come over to our homepage here, and we can... When we get our Dewar back, we need to unpack it and we need to tell Ice Bear that uh, all of these containers, all these pins are now washed and ready for reuse. So we can do that. Now in theory, if you, if you shot absolutely everything and you don't need to keep anything, it's as simple as scanning the Dewar barcode and it will just unpack it all for you. I'm not going to do it that way. What we're going to do is we're going to check this box and uh, we will now scan Your barcode. Okay, this looks vaguely familiar. Right, so we can, if this is if this is the pin that we're interested in, 
we can remove it from the pipe and put it, put it into a storage cane. And if we click this button, then uh, Ice Bear knows that that slot in the puck is empty, but it's still retained that association between the, the crystal and the pin. So at a later date, when we're assembling a shipment, we can scan that pin barcode again, and it knows what crystal we're sending the second time. Uh, we can remove it and, and wash the pin. If you wanted, you could pull the entire puck out and say, well, this, this puck never went anywhere near the beam, so we'll just put that one aside and then we'll, we'll send it again. And again, it's the same idea. You have the dewer there. You could just scan the puck barcode and put the whole puck back into the shipment. Or, if you wanted, you could pull it out and wash all the pins. But, uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, in the default case, uh, where, where, you, where you have used everything, it is literally walk up to it, put the, put the cursor in the box, walk up to your dewer, dip, done. Yes, I definitely want to get rid of them all. Bang. There we go. Simple as that. Okay. So that's uh, where things are at the moment. Um, we're, we're almost at the point of releasing this, but uh, we, we still have some work to do in terms of getting the data down to the synchrotrons automatically. Uh, clearly, there's some... Uh, Stability issues in the in the fishing interface that we haven't quite nailed down yet, but uh, the, the basic functionality is is definitely there. And uh, once we get all this working, uh, I think it'll be really cool when uh, you you have all this information sitting in the database already, and just by scanning the barcodes, you've assembled it all. You press one button, and it's all gone down. And you 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 haven't had to fill in any Excel spreadsheets. You haven't had to enter any data manually. It's just gone for you, all, all ready to go. So there we have it. It's a solved problem. But I'd like to ask if you could think of a way. Many people have their own system that's maybe not ice spare at all, all sorts of different pins, for matches, rims, and so on. Can you think of an easy way? Because they have almost all that information that they need, yep. except a little bit of safety, maybe. Mm. Easily go into yours, because if that goes that way, then it will be. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, certainly theoretically possible. Uh, How we we. To do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing like being on the spot, is there? Um, certainly, as far as different imaging systems go, we can create an importer, and we can go directly from the imaging system into into iSpare. We're, we're doing that with uh, Helsinki at the moment. They have a Rigaku imager where the database structure and the image storage structure is completely different from Formulatrix's. And uh, it's just a case of figuring it out, how they've, how they've stored it, um, and then just creating the plate, creating the plate type, creating the user, uh, importing the image, attaching it to the right position in the plate. Um, and uh, in that case, the screen information is already there. I think you're required to provide it as part of setting the plate up. So we import that information as well. And then uh, at that point, you, you open your plate and it looks exactly like it does here and, and you're good to go. Uh, Could you think of anything like a general purpose API that you can tell people if you hmm. do it so it be a that would be nice if, if everything were standard uh, and you could you could swap backwards and forwards between all of these systems. That would be fantastic. Uh, certainly, as far as the the shipping goes, uh, that that would be ma uh, magic if we could ship from any limbs to any synchrotron, uh, and not just the synchrotrons, but as Rick says, the home source. Uh, the difference with the home source is the direction of the flow, if you like, uh, with the synchrotron. Uh, we kind of tell them that we're coming and uh, here's what we're sending you. Whereas with the home source, you walk up to it and uh, if you're doing plate scanning, then you, you, you shove the plate in. 
and at that point it's going to scan the barcode and it has no idea what it is and it would then have to pull the information from, from the, the, the remote limbs. So it's a slightly different model, but the, the actual amount of data that you would want to exchange would be pretty much identical. I think it's worthwhile because there's going to be, I think, more and more remote shipments. And so this is, this will, when it works, it's going to prevent a lot of typos. Unless you make a typo, you have your original data. That's well, yeah, it can't help you then, yes. Otherwise, it's not a copy. It's always the copy that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. And uh, certainly in the bad old days when we were sending Excel spreadsheets away, it's 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 not a nice way for two computers to talk to each other. There 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 are better ways. Uh, but yeah, the the APIs already exist. Uh, I know Crims is using them at the ESRF to to send directly, so uh, it can be done. Fantastic. This is what we're trying to do, yes, that's right. Uh, I know that uh, Diamond is now generating a new version of this API, so what would be interesting is that indeed we actually uh, agree on a single one, on a single mm -hmm. version, because in the end the data we want to transfer is the same. Okay, we, I think from, from, from my personal point of view, uh, I don't really care whether the structure of this information is like this or like that, so as long as the information is, is the right information. And I think we should be able to have a generic API that connects not just to one synchrotron, mm -hmm. but to any synchrotron and to any uh, uh, home laboratory software that you use. I, I think I think in ESRF, it's a DSRF, and I've been in where we are using this for a few years now, and uh, I think we can provide our, uh, our experience to everyone who, who would be interested in that. Yeah, that's it. I think extending that so that we are exchanging links is uh, is important as well. So uh, you know, you're, you're you're on a web-based system, we're on a web-based system, Synchrotron's on a web-based system. Uh, being able to click seamlessly backwards and forwards between the home lab limbs and and the Synchrotron limbs would be fantastic. Um, at the moment, I don't see a way in the APIs to exchange those URLs, but uh, I may not have looked hard enough yet. No. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. software, whatever. What is important that, that is at the level of, of of communication, everybody can con communicate in a transparent way, because it takes, and you know that. Uh, an incredible amount of work to develop software. Yeah. <laughs> That's what most people is not aware of. And I think if someone is developed once, I think it's important that most people can reuse it. And at least for the APIs that we generated with the ESRF in Grenoble, I think they are available. And that would be good that this can be the same Definitely, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> this, this, uh, this is the And they have, uh, at the moment, a sort of local system. Uh, and, and they are very keen that, that we interact with them so that they can implement whatever we implement together with ESRF and, and you. And, and but what we would like to, uh, I guess, upgrade the existing API. And one idea was to change the send information back. For example, the, uh, the, the link to ISPIB where the information is and we will send our link to them. Mm -hmm. But then we, we can 
when looking into iSpyV, we can look at our database or your database, and, and then looking at our home database, we, we know where the data information is in iSpyV. So, so we, we would like to make it, we'd like to upgrade it, and we discussed that with Stephanie. And the way the project has evolved is that it, it should lead to standardization. Since we heard a lecture, we should have a coffee break. So we'll have, I think, at 10 o'clock.